seminar. Please register tonight. Uh, the program will start tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, lunch will be provided, and then on Sunday, the program will start at 2.30 p.m., and dinner will be provided as part of the program. Inshallah, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a wonderful program. But right now, I'd like to ask the Sheikh to uh, please enlighten us with uh, this topic that he's going to talk to us about. Zakumullah khairan. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's an honor to be here in Dallas and at your beautiful masjid and part of this um, beautiful community. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you and bless your families and to bring you together closer in unity and protect you from any harm, inshaAllah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's... Um, as I said, it's an honor to be here, and I've been definitely shown uh, great uh, hospitality um, uh, this far, and um, alhamdulillah, even perhaps even um, to excess, I guess you would say, but alhamdulillah, you know, um, uh, it's a sign of the, um, the goodness of the people of this community, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in goodness. Uh, tonight, um, I've been, I'd like to share a few um, thoughts or and teachings uh, of the Messenger Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the uh, matters of commerce, matters of economics, uh, which the title of this talk is uh, Economic Protocols of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Economic Protocols, how about that? Better. And maybe you said. And um, I currently teach at Dayton College in, in Berkeley, California. And one of the courses that I teach is a course entitled uh, Commercial Law. Um, commercial Law from an Islamic perspective. And generally what I tell students when we begin is that, um, that we always have to be very careful about terms and be careful especially about how we deal with things um, which would generally be classified under law. Because when we look at the Quran, um, the Quran is more of an, a book of ethics or it's an ethical work rather than a legal book. Uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have laws or rules in it. But um, it is a book uh, which gives much more consideration to how our actions will affect both ourselves and others than it does uh, focus on just the basics of the uh, lawful and prohibited matters of Islam. And I think that's important because another class that I teach is family law. So generally, inside of the classroom, I would tell students that in the classroom, we're going to do with what I like to call sort of family ethics rather than family law. You'll be tested on the law, the rules, what's halal, haram, what's wajib, and things like that. But we need to have discussions. And the reason is that uh, the Prophet what we have to accept first and foremost, is that he came to this world as uh, someone to teach us proper conduct 
إنما بعث وتمي ما كان من أخلاق. I have been sent to perfect noble traits or noble conduct in people. That is fundamentally why the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم was 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 sent. And his teaching, when the Prophet made something haram, that there was always a consideration given to what a particular type of act or transaction. Uh, um, what type of effect it would have on the relationships of people, right? So if we find the prophet prohibiting things, it's given consideration because of that particular consideration most of the time. You know, this is haram because if it was, if we allow it to continue, then it would lead to disputes, and those disputes would lead to fights, and those fights perhaps lead, lead to war. And when war occurs, and then the human race will. Eventually, be obliterated, and if there's no human being on the planet, then there's no one here to worship Allah, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created us to worship Him. So the Prophet Sallallahu was thinking about that. At least that's what we. I think there's enough evidence to to come to that conclusion. Um, this particular topic of wealth, uh, I found that um, from a very young age, when I first started to see things as basic as zakat, there was a time when Muslims weren't very concerned with matters of wealth. Um, you know, we were dealing with, you know, with the five pillars, and, and usually it's like the three pillars. You know, people didn't go to Hajj very much back when I was younger. Uh, people really uh, that I came in contact with weren't concerned very much with zakat. But if you ask the average person what wealth is, well, what is wealth? Whether he tells you the answers I simply get. I mean, what is wealth? It would, you know, how would you define wealth? What does it mean to have wealth? What is that? Equated with what? Money. Right. This is almost 99% of the times when I tell people, I say, what is wealth? They say, money. And money means cash. All right. But cash is actually only a medium of exchange. Cash or currency is not really wealth in the true sense of what wealth is. That wealth, cash or currency is the means to achieve or acquire wealth. When we look at zakat, for instance, the types of, uh, of property or wealth that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he considered to be zakatable. There are things like what? There are things like livestock, gold and silver, um, crops, right? Real wealth, real assets, you know, food, things you can take direct benefit from. Um, livestock, you can eat them, you can ride them, you can you get clothing from them, and things like that. Uh, gold and silver, of course, is a medium of exchange, or for, for purpose of jewelry, for decoration, right? But these are the type of things that we find. But wealth, realistically, when we look at it in much um, take a much deeper, a closer philosophical look at wealth. That wealth fundamentally is is one of the most important parts of being a human being, or just the acquisition of wealth, having wealth, possessing property. That is to say, that many of our value systems are built upon our ideas about wealth. That wealth is what makes desire intelligible, right? And that um, a a uh, in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, he actually refers to wealth as al khair. In that insan al rabbihi la tanu wa inna wa ala zarika la shahid wa inna li hubbi al khairi la shahid. That human being is intense in his love for goodness. Right, and khair for good. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he means by good is wealth. That is because, again, because wealth is what makes makes our desire intelligible. So the good the good in one sense in the ontological sense was sort of the in non moral sense is like whatever we have a desire for, what we incline towards. Right? So 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 a, a child uh, sees another child with a toy and he goes after he grabs it, so that's mine. Right? Even though it's not his or hers that the child does it. So and, and, and it wants to possess. We want to possess. Our whole idea is about like human worth at times. What is your utilitarian value? What sort of utility do you have as a person? 
that people in society were graded or valued according to how much they can produce. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Malu al Banuna Zinatu Hayat al Dunya that wealth and sons are an embellishment of this uh, world. That they are an embellishment of this world. Wealth and sons which oftentimes is translated as children, but realistically in the Arab context of the Jagadi period, as Balloon actually meant sons. And it meant sons in that a valued son because of their particular potential for production. There's a production value that son had compared to, you know, when we compare the as opposed to the value that they generally gave to girls or daughters. Right? So they place great value on sons. And so you look to live in a society, especially agrarian society, and it's polygamy, multiple wives, right? So, so men themselves take multiple wives, have multiple children, it, especially you hope to have sons, you can amass more, you can manage more, you can keep the wealth within your family, right? And in our time, it's almost like we have multiple workers, right, on hand, you pay a cheap wage, right? Right, so, so you can amass much more wealth. Now, Allah also warns us against the dunya, as we know. Right, that, you know, al that object proliferation, object proliferation, I'm sorry, object proliferation has distracted you. Hatta zursumul maqabir, until you visit the grave. Right, so we're always sort of pursuing something. Of course, we have, we need our basic needs, we have basic needs, but at the same time, the human being can never be totally satisfied or totally happy in his life. That Lukana lived in Adam, Wadi Yani Minman, Lukana Sadihan. That if the son of Adam had two valleys of wealth, he would want a third. But the only thing that will fill up the interior of the child of Adam is dirt. That's the only thing that's going to fill you up. So be very careful about our desires. Uh, and, but at any rate, you know, so the Arabs themselves, the, the Bedouins in particular, when they said wealth and man, it automatically meant camels, right, or livestock in general. Yeah. That's what they equated with wealth. In the same way, the Arabs, when they generally said paham or food, it automatically meant a staple like barley or wheat. Generally, that's what they meant by it, when they said paham, the word paham. So these words had these particular connotations there. The, the Quran tells us, Zujjana al Nasi Hubba Shahawati, Mina Nisa'i wa Benina wa Panapina wa Qatara, Mina Zahabi wa Fibba, wa Khayl al Musawamati, wa Al Ami wa Al Harb. So, so it said, made fair seeming, all types of desires have been made fair seeming to men, things such as women, uh, sons, wa Panapina wa Qatara, Mina Zahabi wa Fibba, heaped up heaped up uh, collections of gold and silver, and thieves, uh, uh, well, an army, and livestock, and uh, and, hub, and agriculture. So Allah sort of lists all these things we call real forms of wealth, right? Real forms of wealth. Some of them, they're divided, divided because of their benefit, sons, right, in particular, uh, or the animals that you ride their backs, the livestock, you know, uh, the khayl the, al-musawwama, the, the, the skis or these horses, and then others because of a, an intrinsic benefit that they bring to us. Right, so this is, again, just some of the things that we find in the Quran. We all know that the pursuit of wealth is, is, is lawful and it's not absolutely necessary, there's no doubt about it. But I do want to share with you a few things that I would like to call, I like to call sort of like some protocols or economic, economic protocols of the Prophet Ali Salaam. First, the Prophet of course, he, he says, "In Allah, Abduhu That Allah, He loves to see His servant seeking um, and, and uh, striving in, in search of that which is lawful. And He said, Muslim." That seeking what is lawful is compulsory upon every Muslim. And this is similar to the other hadith, Muslim." That the seeking of knowledge is compulsory upon every Muslim. So the worst first protocol, I would say, and we would say of the Prophet, is the protocol of, like, of lawful acquisition. That we have to ensure that the way that we acquire our wealth is lawful. And there's a hadith where the Prophet, he talks about, uh, there's a man 
ثم ذكر الرجل يطيل السفر يطيل السفر اصحف اكبر يمد يديه الى السماء يا رب يا رب that the prophet he made mention that a person who's out on a journey, a very long journey, and becomes disheveled and covered with dust, he turns and, and, and uh, places his hand in the direction of the sky or the heavens, and he says, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامٌ But his source of food is haram, and his source of drink is haram, and his source of his clothing is haram. وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامٌ And he's nourished with haram. فَأَنَّا يُشْجَابُ لَهُ so how can they expect to be answered? How can his prayers be expected to be answered? So the first protocol is that, that the way that we acquire our wealth has to be lawful. We can't acquire our wealth through stealing, for instance. Right? That, that it has to be uh, acquired in the proper fashion. And then we have what we call lawful, lawful possession. Lawful possession and, and milk is halal. And this is fundamentally what we can what we, we talk, what we talk about when we say that there's certain types of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for us to possess and there are other things that he does not allow for us to possess. إِنَّ اللَّهُ بَرَسُولَهُ حَرَّمَا بَيْلَ الْخَمْرِ وَالْخَنْجِيرِ وَالْمَيْتَةِ وَالْأَخْمَى That Allah and His Messenger, they are forbidden the sale of wine, of pork, of of, of, of carry-on and, and idols. That the Prophet of Islam forbade those different things. So, 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 so we, though, of course, uh, commerce is lawful and necessary, that it is become obligation for you to ensure that the things that we are seeking to possess are lawful to possess. And actually what's interesting is that that the things, the number of things that are unlawful are actually far fewer than the things that are lawful. And this is why the ulama generally say, that the presumptive judgment of basic business transactions is that things are lawful until proven haram. That you, if you find out there's a new transaction that comes up, pops up tomorrow, for instance, that, you know, never heard of before, then the automatically our default state to be haram. Our default should not be haram, you know, even though that is generally the attitude that we have. Yeah, but and our default is supposed to be, it's haram. Right. But if we find evidence of it being haram, then okay, all right, I, I, won't, I won't embark upon this particular type of transaction. So, but so in scholars like Khalid Abu Bakr ibn Arabi actually goes as far as to say that actually there are only 56 transactions that were explicitly prohibited by the Prophet, a.s. Right. And you know, there are many different types of transactions that are there. So, lawful acquisition, lawful possession. The third is mutual consent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن خراب منكم That do not devour your wealth, wealth between one another, uh, falsely. And let it only be based upon tijara, commerce, or trade, عن خراب منكم that it based upon mutual consent uh, among you. And that it should be mutual consent. That people should not be compelled to go into a particular transaction. A fourth protocol, I would say, and of course I'm trying to summarize something that I'm going to be talking about for two, just for two days. All right, you know, and, uh, uh, hopefully not bore you too much. But I'll go through a few more and then, then and I'll, I'll conclude. But another example is what we would call sort of equitable exchange. That there's an equitable exchange between the individual who's uh, selling and the person who is buying, rather than it only benefiting one party in the transaction. Okay. So that's another protocol. Another is we call transparency. And in transparency, this is when we avoid fraudulent practices. Like for instance, once the Prophet was in the marketplace and he passed by the station of a, one of the merchants who had who was selling barley. The Prophet ﷺ had suspected that there was something wrong with the barley. So he put his hand inside of the bag. And he got all the way to the bottom of the bag when he discovered that at the bottom, all the barley at the bottom of the bag was wet. Uh, so he asked the, the merchant, he said to him, um, what's this? And they said, oh, Rasulullah, it was, the rain, it was, it was, it rained last night and it got it wet. And so I put the, the wet barley at the bottom and I put the dry barley on the top. 
And then the prophet said to him, well, wouldn't you think it was, shouldn't you do the opposite? You put the, the wet barley on the top so the individual coming by would know that there's a defect. And then he said, Those who defraud us are not from us, uh, from, not from among us. Those who defraud us uh, or deceive us are not one of us, okay? or not one of mine. So, so this is this famous um, uh, example. So, so issues of, fraud, of, of fraudulent transactions are important to avoid. And then lastly, I'll just say this one for now, is that one of the principles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well was that that if a person can't work, he should not beg. I mean, if the person can work, one should not beg. Which is something I think often we don't think about in our community today, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he encouraged people to seek halal income. Um, he, he, for instance, uh, Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas had come to him on one occasion and said, Ya Rasulullah, how much of my wealth should I will to someone else? Should I will all of it? He said, no. He said, half of it? He said, no. He said, one third? He said, one third. Wasurufu kathir. And one third is a lot. He said, it's better for you to leave your family rich than for you to leave them dependent Yet the Kafafun and Nas, he ate him, sitting on the road with their hands out asking people for, for wealth. And another hadith, he mentioned that, that it is um, for a person, for a person to go out and gather firewood and place it on their backs to sell, is better than for one to come asking people, come with one's hands out, Asking people who may give or not give to him. Who might give or not give to him. And the Prophet also said, That not a single person, there's not a single person, there's, not, there's no food that any person ever eats which is better than whatever he eats from the work of his own hand. And the Prophet David, alayhi salam, he used to eat from the work of his own hand. So, so one of the principles, or the, what we said, the protocols of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was that if a person is able to work, then one should not beg. And we live in a society right now becoming more and more polarized along so many different lines. And one of those lines is the difference between the rich and the poor, the 1% and the 99%, is this, it is like a sin to be rich. It is a sin to have wealth, right? Or we think about the crash in 2008, and we put so much of a burden of responsibility on Wall Street, and I'm not saying that they don't have the responsibility, you know, but they're definitely responsible for the crash. And there were people gambling on Wall Street, but we forget about the contribution of Main Street. Right? Because there are a lot of people investing in Wall Street, seeking, the returns, and they were greedy as well, right? And, 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 and what happens when you go into business is that you take risks like that. You know, yet you can win a profit and get gain, and sometimes you, you lose. That's what happens in business, right? You know, but it's so much focus on just those who are super rich. And we forget about that, for instance, that companies were lending money and people were taking the loans, right? and people defaulted on those loans as well. Right? So we play a part. Those at the top and those at the bottom play a part in the whole system itself. That you know that the system will be better if maybe the companies gave fewer loans, right? and and more people who took loans actually paid them back. Right? So it goes both ways. Right? So so it's not just simply about going all specially having our hands out. And there are many other uh, examples I can mention of, uh, I like to call sort of the sort of economic protocols of the Prophet Islam. But ultimately what's important to know is that Muslim Allah was more concerned about our akhirah. Right? So when he, uh, when he gave these prohibitions, he prohibited certain types of transactions, he, he prohibited all transactions largely with the aim of 
increasing um, the uh, human solidarity, human solidarity. That if I sell you, if I trade my cat for your cow, right, for instance, you know, you might feel at the moment that it's a good trade, but then later on you realize, well, cats don't produce milk, you know, and you might probably live in, mo like most countries, and people don't eat cats, right? And what can a cat really do for you? you know? so, so he wanted to remove those, sense, those, those possi the possible sense of, of betrayal or exploitation uh, uh, as happening between people, so as to lessen that. Uh, and so that was one of his major concerns. Um, so at any rate, there a lot of there's a lot that can be talked about right now. I hope that these are some some beneficial uh, words that can um, help all of us to uh, um, to reflect upon and implement our lives, inshallah, and moving forward. But hopefully, um, some of you will be able to join us this weekend as well as we delve deeper into these issues. سبحان الله بك رب العزة عما يتكون والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله